This is what is really going on. And you are telling them to embrace peace because the government is seeing this as farmer head class. So they would advise you to live peaceably. That's why we are telling the government, begin the process to officially gazette these people. Again, let me tell, take you back to Boko Haram. Nobody goes to any uh, community that is attacked by Boko Haram to tell them, live peaceably with your neighbors because they've been officially gazetted. And Nigerian military knows what they are dealing with, terrorists. But now when you see them as, oh, two fighting, it becomes an issue of trying to separate the two guys that are fighting. No, two guys are not fighting. One person has an agenda, ideological agenda, political agenda, religious agenda, and they are pursuing it. In continuation of the public policy advocacy work we've been doing around the incident killings in the Middle Belt, I was recently invited by Arias Television to offer perspectives on the issue, especially in relation to the Christmas Eve killings in Klaatu communities. Uh, I have accepted a few portions of the interview uh, for your uh, uh, viewing purposes. And I'll encourage you to watch and also share this on your platforms until it gets to government actors, especially governments, subnational governments in those affected communities to see that what they are dealing with is not uh, two fighting, but an act of terror. And they begin to prosecute it as terror, including the ideas we impanel during the program of recommending to them that they should begin the process of officially gazetting and declaring this as an act of terror. So please take a listen and let me know what you think at the end of the program. And more, moreover, you can watch the full segment of the interview on Arise TV's official YouTube handle. What I've just done is to clip out a few portions of the interview I find interesting and that I felt to share with you. My name is Chima Christian. Africa's morning is at hand. Over 50,000 soldiers are currently involved in several peacekeeping operations across Nigeria. That's according to the country's chief of army staff, Lieutenant General Tarid Lagbaja. As it stands, the internal security operations where troops are involved are counter-terrorism efforts in the northeast, kidnapping and banditry in the northwest and north central, separatist operations in the southeast and combating oil thieves in the south south. A plethora of security challenges bedevil in the country and an end needs to come soon. After the recent attack in Plateau State, Vice President Kashim Shetima alongside the Chief of Defense Staff and the NSA paid a visit to the communities where bandits killed over 150 persons. The Vice President vows that the federal government will fish out attackers and prosecute them. An end to the unwanted killing needs to come as soon as possible. I'll be joined in the studio by Captain Bish Johnson, a security expert and a former U.S. Army captain, and Chima Christian, a public policy analyst and executive director of Africa's Morning Center for Public Policy and Good Governance. I'm Sulaiman Alede, and this is Arise Prime Time. Well, Chima, uh, you're very familiar with the terrain, with the area, with the people, and uh, uh, our hearts, uh, our condolences to those uh, who are lost, but how are they coping at the moment? Well, it's a terrible humanitarian situation. <clears throat> and um, for instance, Mangu is close to Mangu local government area, uh, received part of the attacks, is close to Bokos local government area, where this latest had the more number of people killed. In Mangu alone, where I had visited less than two months ago, I had gone to these communities, I've seen the level of destruction. In one of the IDP camps, in Mangu, there's four IDP camps and 12 distribution centers. One of the IDP camps I visited had 4,000 households, close to 7,000 individuals in an IDP camp. And then one of the prominent politicians of this nation visited that local government, and uh, that uh, uh, state. And the particular IDP camp received 72 bags of rice. And 72 bags of rice were distributed to 4,000 households. And each household was getting a cup of rice. And then the day they were distributing a cup of rice, they had to bring in soldiers from helping to manage the distribution of uh, a cup of rice. So you see that people are hungry, angry, and frustrated to the point that they are struggling and fighting each other over a cup of rice, not for one individual, but for one household. This is just to paint a picture of the humanitarian disaster that is happening on that scale. Move away from the humanitarian disaster. And, and my point is that what I've seen, because I've spent eight months studying the insecurity in the middle belt, and what we've seen is that the insecurity in the middle belt is not what is reported. What I thought while going into the middle belt was that, oh, there is a farmer header clash, and I didn't see one 
I've been to Nasarawa, I've been to Benue, I've been to Plateau. I've not been to Southern Kaduna. I limited my thing to Northern Kaduna where I just gathered secondary materials. But then what you find in Southern Kaduna is not going to be different from what you find in the three states I've talked to you about. What is happening is an act of terror. And I'll give you this. I'll refer you to Nigeria's laws, Terrorism Prevention and Prohibition Act of 2022. If you go to section three, subsection C, so let's just read so that you see what I'm saying. The law says that an act of terror is an act committed by, let's see, in this act, act of terrorism means an act willfully performed with the intention of furthering an ideology, whether political, religious, racial, or ethnic, in which, I'll now jump to section 3C, subsection 3C, in which seriously intimidates a population. What's your report in intimidates a population? That's number one. Then D, which seriously destabilizes or destroys the fundamental political, constitutional, economic, or social structures of a country or international organization. What you are reporting also contravenes this act. D, um, or uh, let's go to F, which violates the provisions of any international treaty or resolution to which Nigeria is a party or subject to the provisions of you know, section 12 of the constitution. Then G, I will read GII and IV and I'll end with that. GI, which causes or involves or a result in I, attack on a person's life in the form of grievous bodily harm or death. Now go to III, destruction of a facility including a private property which may likely endanger human life or result in major economic loss. And then V, the people who are engaged in the manufacture, possession, acquisition, transfer, supply or use of weapons. Every other thing that is captured by this law as terrorism is what we are reporting. Why do we keep calling it Farmaheda crisis? Let me bring in Beish here because the response time they say is almost totally absent. That, that's it. So uh, I'll come back to the response time. Let me also try to be establishing the, the base of the, the, the discussion. You usually ask yourself, what happens to these communities after they've been attacked? Usually a particular community is attacked like three or four times over a one year period and the people in that community feel so unsafe, they move to the neighboring community or to an IDP camp. And you would expect that those communities will remain empty. No, they won't. People come in there and settle there. As I'm speaking with you, go to Moon Council Ward in Kwandeluku government area of uh, Benue State. As I'm speaking to you, you have almost 38 communities in Mango local government alone that have been repossessed by people. And these are places where you have some places. You know that Plateau, for instance, used to be a mining site when Nigeria was big on iron mining and all of those oil minings. Those, these people are taking over those strategic places and they are taking over bodies of water and they are taking and they settle there. And so it is not as if they attack and people can move back to their communities. When people try to move back to their communities, the attacks resume and they run away. So people are living in their houses now. And then if you go back to the... So houses, it's a case of attack, <coughs> sack, and occupy, replace, occupy. And replace. And then if you move a bit further to see the modality and in the upcoming census, NPC is not going to be accounting those demolished houses. NPC is not going to be counting them. NPC is going to be instead counting new settlements close to those demolished houses. So there is a serious problem you have on your hands. It's beyond what is being painted by the media. I, let's still stay on the cause of the problem. And you find a community who they will tell you they are coming. And they come, droves, in some cases 250 people. And then the community has like 20 or 30 vigilante services against who have pump action rifles, who you know that the effective range of a good pump action, depending on the bullets you're using, is 30 meter. And these guys have 400 meter weapon that they can fire at you from 400 meters away and they aim you and they get you. Sometimes they have surface to air missiles. Sometimes they have weapons that can fire at operative range of 800 meters. This is sometimes they come with 15 meter caliber weapons and the military grade assault rifles they are coming with is superior to what our Nigerian army has. This is not your regular pastoralists. This is not them. This is a full-fledged terrorist organization. And when you hear the vice president telling people to live in peace, to embrace peace, no, you are embracing deaths. So what you are telling them is to sit in your, in one of the people I interviewed, I can still see their faces, really. I've been to these places, I've seen shallow graves, I've talked to kids, I've seen people who had different kinds of things. The pictures are all over my laptop here. I can show you this after the program. If you see what is really happening, one of the people I talked to, I said, why are you staying in this community? You know that they will come back. He said, life in the IDP camp is death. Life in the community is death. I don't know whether they are coming or not, but I can't stay either ways.
So they are waiting to be killed. It's just that dying is tormentally. This is what is really going on. And you are telling them to embrace peace because the government is seeing this as farmer head class. So they would advise you to live peaceably. That's why we are telling the government, begin the process to officially gazette these people. Again, let me tell, take you back to Boko Haram. Nobody goes to any uh, community that is attacked by Boko Haram to tell them, live peaceably with your neighbors because they've been officially gazetted. And Nigerian military knows what they are dealing with, terrorists. But now when you see them as, oh, two fighting, it becomes an issue of trying to separate the two guys that are fighting. No, two guys are not fighting. One person has an agenda, ideological agenda, political agenda, religious agenda, and they are pursuing it. And then if you ask the communities, what do you hear when they come? They start chanting religious chants before they attack. And in many of the cases, you ask them at yourselves, especially when they have time to attack, sometimes they cordon off the security issue, they cordon off the community and start slaughtering with knives. And why are they not killing with the weapons they have? Why are they slaughtering with knives? So there are a lot of issues that you see on display here that that you would see that indeed the federal government is doing plateau people, Benue people, and indeed all of those people. And I hear my elder brother talking about, uh, you know, these are not border communities. Plateau is not a border, Benue, um, um, uh, Kaduna. So these, these uh, they move up and down. So you talk. You know, you know uh, we really don't have much time. But again, one other thing is that, uh, Bish, if, if he's saying that these are people who have come to attack uh, uh, these communities, that they are not farmers, they're not herders. If he's been able to glean this or investigate that, what's difficult for the NSA and his uh, team to, to unearth? So uh, why are we trying to paper over crack? Absolutely nothing. They, they have more resources at their disposal to conduct even better research than he did. Yes. I have alluded to the fact that I don't believe that it's farmer herders clashes. Because if it is, we ought to have solved it. Because the answer is not in the sky, it's here. We don't need to reinvent, reinvent anything to solve the problem. I said it that it's much more deeper than that.